Hi gang, it's your old pal K.R. King here helping you homebrew your own D&D campaign. And today I'm going to be talking about the first level dungeon of the Mad Mage. So last week I redrew this level using the Dungeon Draft software package. Uh, today I'm going to begin to look at this level uh, from a GM's perspective. You know, and I say begin because this is going to be a first in a couple videos. There's a lot of stuff to cover on this level. And, you know, even though I don't run modules, I love to read them. I love to, you know, learn about the philosophy that's behind the geography of the dungeon in terms of its map, but also in terms of the denizens of, you know, NPCs and monsters that you find there. You know, I'm always thinking about what it would be like as a group of players to enter this dungeon and make their way through, you know, to the end point if it's a level one dungeon or to the area that transports them to the next level, whether that's, a you know, stairs or elevator or some teleport circle. And then I think about what I would have to do as a GM so that it all makes sense. You know, in other words, how do you achieve that ineffable balance between verisimilitude and suspension of disbelief? Okay, folks, before we start, a quick clarification. Uh, yesterday when I'm getting ready, I usually publish on Saturday and I'm going through my last run through and I realize on the video, I say hobgoblin instead of bugbear many times. The thing is, there are no hobgoblins on level one of the Mad Mage's dungeon. So I thought about, oh, I gotta reshoot this or I gotta put a graphic up. So instead I'm doing this, the thing is, every time I say Hobgoblin on this video, I mean Bugbear. All right, thanks. All right, so I'm going to be using the map that I made in the Dungeon Draft mapping software for this discussion. And specifically in this video, I'm going to be talking about these sections here on this side of the map. I'll go over the other sections in uh, later videos. I'm also going to be referencing some points I made in an earlier video about the overall setup of the, you know, the Dungeon of the Mad Mage, uh, the history of Halister, the history of Waterdeep, where it's located, and the history of the Yawning Portal, the tavern that contains the entrance to the dungeon. So you can reference that video if you like, or you could buy the book and just read about it. But you know, it's interesting, when they introduce this level, the structure they use is to identify the two major power groups that dominate you know, a whole series of rooms on this first level. You know, and then they give you a sense of the wandering monsters that the players may encounter as they're moving through the level or as they, they stop to take a short or long rest. All right, so in reference to these two competing power groups on the level, one is localized, it's just there in the dungeon. Another is what I call global because it has connections to the outside world. So the local one is a group of bandits uh, who call themselves the Undertakers. And they demand a toll of 10 gold pieces for anyone who happens to wander by to not harass them. And the global group is a, some hobgoblins and goblins who are under the control of Xanathar. And in fact, a bunch of the hobgoblins are under the control of intellect devourers. But basically, Xanathar's group, he wants to control access to this level. Uh, he wants to take control of this bandit group, the Undertakers. All right, so the Undertakers are described as a group of failed actors who've come down to this level and they impersonate vampires. They're experts in disguise, they have fake teeth, you know, makeup, this sort of thing. And what they do is they scare people that pass through, they charge 10 gold pieces per uh, party member in order to you know, leave them alone, uh, pass the group, whatever. It's, as we'll see, it's a little ambiguous. And you know, their disguise level, they have a DC 14 you know, insight check for any members of the group to see through this disguise and go, hey, these are not vampires. Now what's interesting here is they occupy a fairly large area of this dungeon, you know, as opposed, I guess, to their power level. Areas six, seven, and eight. As area seven is an actual crypt of a vampire that once lived here. Suppose, I guess this gave them the idea for this, and this is where they retreat uh, if things go wrong and they have to make their last stand. Now there's some interesting wrinkles here to the composition of the Undertakers. You have, first of all, two competing groups, these two bandit captains who were former lovers uh, who are now sort of scheming to take over. And the female captain, Haria, has a flesh golem servant. Uh, it came along and mistook her for its creator and now serves her. So in terms of the number of bandits, uh, they don't just give you a list in the book. It'd be very good if they just, you know, had a list of all the numbers here. You got to kind of look through the rooms and figure this out. And it can cause some confusion. I counted 12 bandits. 
seven with Haria, and five with Ukturl, who is the male bandit chief. Now, what's funny is I've seen on Reddit that uh, as many as 18 bandits are described, but I think there's confusion. They have this thing in a room, you'll have four bandits, but unless they've been encountered elsewhere. And so I think that uh, when they talk about the main areas, 6A and uh, I think 8A or whatever, look at those, count those up, and you'll find there's 12 bandits. Now, the other wrinkle you have is doppelgangers. Two with Ukturl, one with Haria. You know, the goals and whatnot of doppelgangers are a bit obscure. I, I find this kind of a strange idea. And in fact, I feel like The Undertaker's, as written, doesn't quite hold water. Because the designers give them a DC-14 in terms of an insight check to see through the disguise, but if you've got five party members and someone with a high wisdom, you know, they're probably going to see through it. You know, it's not DC-25. But you know, even worse, if this ruse, you know, fools people, that's going to cause an uproar. People are going to hunt down these vampires. If anything, they're going to be paid by the owner of the Yawning Portal Tavern. You do not want vampires hanging around right at the entrance to this dungeon. It's bad for business and vampires spread like a virus. So for me, this scam should be a new one. These are these actors are on the run, maybe some failed thing they tried to do. They've just gotten down there. They're just trying this out. And as for the doppelgangers, I'm not sure why they're there. I, I've seen, again, things on Reddit where they say, oh, the Undertakers know that they're doppelgangers and they use them, they change their appearance and they go back and forth to the Yawning Portal to get supplies. Maybe, but you know, the problem is doppelgangers fill people with intense, you know, fear and loathing. I just don't know whether they'd want them in their group because their objectives, they have no interest in these, you know, these bandits at all. You know, they just want to kill people and replace them. So I don't know if I'd keep them. All right, so the group that's competing with the Undertakers for control of this level are nine bugbears, uh, 42 goblins, and two Etten. Thing is, the twist here is five of the bugbears are actually controlled by intellect devourers. And one of their goals is to capture one of the captains of the Undertakers, uh, replace their brain with the intellect devourer so that Xanathar can use them to cement his control over this level. And the Undertakers are aware of this bugbear goblin group. Uh, they, they say that in the text that if they can't you know, kill or intimidate player characters, they may try to convince them, hey, go after these hobgoblins. So the bugbears have controls in the uh, rooms in areas 23, 28, and 39. And they have a spy, two bugbears that are controlled by intellect devourers in room number two. So according to the text, the plan is for the bugbears, uh, goblins, to capture a bandit captain, take him or her back to Skullport, replace their brain with one, you know, an intellect devourer, bring them back to control the other bandits, and then, you know, have further control over this level. And as you can see by my description, this seems awfully complicated. I'm sort of confused. Why not just, you know, attack them, uh, capture them, have an intellect devourer, leave one of the hobgoblins, and enter uh, the captain right there on site. I'm just saying. So whatever the logic, you know, what you have here when you have two groups uh, like this that are controlling large areas of this dungeon is a classic tactic to sort of explain why creatures, many of whom like, you know, humans, would occupy the dank, you know, dark hallways of a dungeon. Because both of these groups have a very good reason to stay there. You know, the people that are working for Xanathar, you know, they, they don't dare go against him. And these human actors are sort of on the run, you know, hiding out. They've come up with this scam. And there's another aspect to this. As I mentioned in my earlier video on the general Mad Mage setup, uh, this, they have this knot of the weave, which is this after effect when the elves destroyed their capital. And it causes creatures that come to these dungeons to have this sort of obsessive desire to stay there. It affects Halister too. And this becomes more apparent as you go deeper and deeper into the various levels of the Mad Mage, because many of the other creatures that you're going to meet you know, around these power groups are creatures that you would expect to see in a dungeon. All right, the next thing they do in this setup is to explain wandering monsters. And it's important to a distinction between wandering monsters and random monsters. A wandering monster is something that lives here, let's say in this dungeon, but wanders the halls looking for its food. Whereas a random monster is something that just happens to be, you know, in the same area of the players at a certain place in time. It's truly random. The point here is that with a wandering monster, you're not just rolling on some chart. You as the GM, starting before they don't, when you're putting to get this uh, dungeon together, you know what the sort of creatures are that are just wandering around finding food. And the designers provide the usual, you know, suspects here. You got carrion crawlers, you got oozes of various kinds, 
uh, giant spiders. But they also throw in some interesting, you know, wrinkle. They have two bickering goblins that are not affiliated with the group of goblins that are with the hobgoblins. So they know about the goblins and potentially the players that they meet them and don't just kill them off. They might, you know, give them information for their lives about what's going on with these goblins. And you also have a shield guardian that's been wandering on autopilot since its wizard master was killed on level four of the dungeon. And the shield guardian does some, you know, performative sort of spell things and then kind of wanders off if the players ignore it. Uh, but on its shield is a rune, and this is a seed item. The, uh, this rune is from its master on the fourth level. Uh, if the players go there, they can find this amulet with this rune on it and possibly then take over and have a shield guardian. And we're going to see some more of these seed items. And, and you know, obviously it's a tradition in D&D to have something you find that doesn't seem to have any purpose. You hang on to it and later on it does have a purpose. All right, so now let's look at what the players will experience when they enter this level. So the dungeon is designed for a fifth level characters. I'm going to say party of five fifth level characters. So they go down a 140 foot shaft from the Yawning Portal Tavern into room number one. We have a wide corridor going off to the southwest. We have a large pile of sand in the center of the room that's fallen down uh, from this shaft. And we have a secret door in the northeast corner with a spy hole drilled in it. If the players search the sand, they will find various discarded items, uh, nothing of any real value, but it does give the players a sense that, hey, if you see a pile of sand or whatever, look through it. You know, examine these rooms. There's stuff here. Now, behind the secret door is one of the Undertakers, a bandit who is looking through. When he sees, you know, the player characters come down into the uh, first room, he runs off, dashes off, basically, to warn the other Undertakers, hey, there's a new group in the dungeon. Now, as a GM and a player, I have a serious issue with this secret door because it wouldn't be a secret. Because every adventurer that comes into this dungeon has to go to this room, and first of all, it has a spy hole drilled in it, but secondly, there, you know, there, enough of them are gonna, hey, there's a secret door here, and adventurers talk. So you have to make a choice with this kind of thing. Do you play it straight up? There's a secret door, a spy hole, if the players don't examine it, they don't know about it, or they do know about it, it is a secret door, or do you change it? You just have a door there, or you just have open corridor. So let's think about what's happening when the players enter this room. Number one, the bandit sees them. He dashes up here to area six uh, so that the bandits can gather all in room 6A to wait for the players to get there. And if the players discover this, you know, secret door, they make a DC 20 insight check. They hear the bandit running away. They may just go right out this hallway, go to 6A, get the scary vampire act, and then what happens? So with five characters, the vampires are going to ask for 50 gold pieces for safe passage. It's not really defined what that is, but I, you know, I have some ideas. Since the Undertakers know about the bugbears, they might direct the players in that direction, you know, without telling them. That way you have two groups, you know, fighting each other, makes the bugbears less strong. Or the Undertakers are split into two sections. So what if Octural was in uh, room six, you know, gets his 50 gold and directs them towards Haria. Now again, what if the players see through the disguise of DC-14 and they go, well, these are not vampires. But before I do that, I might say, you could have some fun with this. What if these actors are really good? Well, think about like in the United States, we have these haunted houses at Halloween where people go and you get really scared and whatnot. What if you make a presentation? What if, you know, it's really scary and you really set it up such that it is really sort of believable and you up the DC a little bit, maybe a DC-20, maybe even higher. I don't know. Think about that. So here's the thing. If the players either aren't interested in paying the gold to these vampires or they see through the disguise and a battle ensues, what happens with the bandits in Area 8? Do they come to their compatriots' aid or do they wait until the noise dies down and then they come down to pick off what remains? And don't forget, Haria has a flesh golem. You know, these do some damage and they can go berserk. But you know, I have a big question about this Undertaker setup in terms of you know, do they want this group to come to them? Do they want to get their, you know, gold pieces? You know, if so, then why have a secret door? I guess they got the spy hole, but you could have just a door there. You could have an open hallway because they want the players to come up here to where they can get to this room. But if not, there's a possibility that the players either don't see the secret door or just decide not to go there and they go through the open corridor to the southeast. 
And they're going to go through here and get to room 2B, where there are two bugbears controlled by intellect devourers who are watching. And the text says that when the bugbears realize, oh, there's a group of, you know, these adventurers coming, they're going to take this route down here to go around to the Area 23 to warn the other bugbears controlled by intellect devourers. So why are they taking this long route when it looks you can take this shorter route up here to the north? Well, this room has this nasty little magical effect. It has these magic mirrors, five of them. They don't say where the mirrors are. I just rolled them up randomly and placed them. Uh, these two westernmost mirrors, when a player goes between them, you get two duplicates of that player that comes out basically with the stats of shadows. Now, it says that they can't create new shadows, but do they have the shadow strength drain? That's up to you. You know, the hobgoblins avoid this area, so maybe they do, or maybe it's just because it's such a pain. Because the players are going to have to realize when they start fighting these things that every time they pass through between these mirrors, they are two duplicates. Now, you could say it's just one per player if you want to put a limit on it but still that's up to 10 with a party of five that they have to fight you know and there's a magic item behind another one of these mirrors that i'll talk about later but again they're going to be investigating and here's the thing when these bugbears take this southern route and go around to 23 uh, it takes 10 turns of dashing uh, for the bugbears to get there so now the players go through this room uh, if they go in the hall of mirrors and they have this battle how long does it take this is an important reason why you should track time because the players may get through this room, come down here, uh, and, you know, encounter the bugbears. Two additional bugbears would make a difference. But, you know, it, it depends on what the players do. As always, they, uh, when the bugbears leave the room, they have a stealth of 16. The text says that if the players uh, have a better uh, passive perception, uh, you know, one of the players, they can detect the bugbears. Hey, they, somebody went down to this corridor to the south, and they might just follow the bugbears. Now, they might go to the north, and then they're going to run into the undertakers this way, potentially. Now, here's another thing. Let's suppose they get through the Hall of Mirrors, and they get down here to where the bugbears are before 10 turns have passed. Could they surprise them? No. Because, you know, intellect devourers have detect sentience. They can detect any creature uh, that is sentient with an intelligence of three or above, they can detect them within 300 feet. And since it says that with this ability they can't be surprised, I would infer that they can track, you know, where this sentient intelligence or intelligence is various ones, they can track where they are in space. And the intellect of ours have telepathy up to 60 feet. And this begs the question of why do they have these two sentinel bugbears in room 2B when it's within 60 feet of 23C? The only reason I can think of is that they have them in 2B, they go up to here, so that they can have their 300 foot detection all the way up to the edge of the bandit's realm up here in area 8. Then, you know, they detect the players coming, they move to 2B to see, you know, which direction the players are going to go. When they realize this new party is coming, they don't want to go through the Hall of Mirrors, but they don't want to be caught alone, just two bugbears, so that's why they go down to the south and come around. All right, so let's suppose that the players go through uh, the Hall of Mirrors, and they, it takes longer than 10 turns, you know, I guess. And so they meet, you know, four of these uh, bugbears uh, and 15 goblins. Now, the thing is, the bugbears, as intellect of ours, can't be surprised. So in theory, whether the players go through this northern passage or this southern one, they can maneuver around and they can get on either side of the players, flank them. Do they simply attack the group? Or as the text suggests, you could have the hobgoblins say, hey, we want you to go to these northern rooms and take out the Undertaker. Now, let's just say you have a battle, a standard thing. Three things can happen. One, the players can lose the battle. Although, I feel like uh, with these, uh, you know, four hobgoblins is tough, 15 goblins. Depends on, you know, competent players at fifth level, depending on the party composition, should be able to win. Unless they've taken damage, you know, from the Hall of Mirrors or, you know, if they've already had a run-in with the Undertaker. Now, the second one, of course, is the... Players defeat the hobgoblins, goblins, they kill them all or, you know, make them surrender, whatever. And the last is the players defeat the hobgoblins, intellect you know, like devourers, God, but some of them run away. They escape. Now, in any of these scenarios, if the players kill a hobgoblin that has a possessed, you know, intellect devourer, it's going to leave the body. They're going to realize, oh my gosh, there's intellect devourers. And of course, that intellect devourer is going to try to probably possess one of the players, maybe a goblin that seems kind of useless. And the goblins are going to see this and be like, holy shit, and they may run. So again, you could have, you know, a player with an intellect devourer here, whatever. You know, it just depends. And, you know, that, that causes a whole set of new complications. Now, what's interesting here is there's two other sets of hobgoblin slash intellect devourers in rooms uh, 28 and 39. 
too far away for the 60 foot telepathic communication. But if you look at these over here in 28, uh, they could be close enough to 23C uh, to at least be aware of the sentience. And I would assume aware of the sentience of the other intellect devourers. And they could see if a battle occurs and, you know, sentences are disappearing. And then finally, if the players go south and they go to the east, they will avoid this group uh, of intellect uh, devourer hobgoblins in 23C, but they're all going to be aware of this sentience. And so then now you've got them coming behind and the other one's aware of them coming towards them. And I'm going to cover this whole scenario in the next video. So what I want to end with here are some interesting rooms that are in this section that you can add to your dungeon making practice. So room number five is a classic resource drain. It's a dead end room with monsters and no treasure. You have two grells, each is hovering in this alcove with the, you know, bones of its victims beneath. Uh, it's described in the text they're voraciously hungry and they will pursue anyone who comes in the room uh, and they move 40. So basically the players are probably gonna have to fight them and kill them. And that means potentially using spells and using hit points. All right, and in the Hall of Mirrors, as I mentioned, one of the mirrors that's magical, but not uh, a duplicate mirror. Uh, if you break the illusion and look behind it, you will find a bronze mask which is a mask of Halister himself. It's worth 50 gold. Uh, it has magic, but uh, doesn't seem to do anything. What happens is if you go down here to room 27, there is a base relief sculpture uh, that's kind of shattered, and beneath it is this inscription, Gaze upon me with bronzed visage, and secrets I will reveal. So if the players have the bronze mask, one of them can don the... Uh, you know, the thing, and look at the sculpture, and they are teleported to a 30 by 30 foot demiplane. Is this a screw job? No. There's a simulacrum of Halister himself, which says to them, basically, I will answer three questions. One is a lie, and two are truthful. The players don't know which is a lie or truthful, but again, it gives them information. Then it disappears uh, with, the, with a little more exploration, and the player with the mask can reach through the mist, and the other players can take the mask and they can enter the demiplane. So it's a perfect place for a long or short rest. And if you look, it's halfway here between the various power centers of the dungeon. And then you have some sort of folly rooms or some magic, you know, kind of minor magic. The folly room I talked, room 10, this is filled with skulls. These are the various adventurers who've been killed in the dungeon. And for a laugh, Halister gathers them all together. When the players open it, they fall out or whatever. There's nothing in here. This is the thing, when you're building a dungeon, you can have rooms that don't have something in them. You can have dead ends. Why? Who knows? Maybe they were interrupted when they were building it, you know, or, or whatever. It doesn't, you know, just, just to give your thing a sense of there are things that, that aren't explained. There are things that don't even quite make sense. You know, or there are things that, you know, this the folly, the sort of personality of Halister coming through. And then we have this room 11 right here. It has a throne and a helm covered in cobwebs on the floor. If a player puts on the helm, sits at the throne, from the ceiling falls a wand of secrets, which is 1d3 per day. You get a chance if you use it to detect a secret door within 30 feet. It's not a tremendously powerful item. And again, all they did was sit on the throne. They had to do a little thinking, but it can be very useful if they see a room where they think, hey, I wonder if there's a secret door here. Now, obviously, when you do this kind of thing, don't forget, you can have this kind of same setup, but something bad happens. Again, do you want to have something like, you know, you go insane and you have to have a remove curse? I guess that's a little possible. You know, if you look at what a wand of secrets does, but you know, you can have some temporary thing there, you know, mind stun for a certain number of turns or something where, you know, it, it hurts the player for a while. The thing you're doing is every time you figure something out, you're taking a risk. It's not always a good thing to figure these things out. So someone, you know, you got to have risk takers. All right. So that's the first part of my discussion on the Mad Mage Level 1 Dungeon. I'll have more in the next video. Until then, if you like what you've seen, please subscribe to my channel. I'm always looking for more, and please leave some comments. I love to read them. Most importantly, my friends, keep playing the greatest game ever invented, and tell somebody else about it.